Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Genesis chapter 22. We're going to be in verse 1 and we're going to talk about the Lord provides. Thank the Lord. We've been learning about faith and we've been going through Hebrews and we'll be in Hebrews near the end of the, uh, the scriptures today. We're gonna start with Genesis 22 first and you know, we're in a story here where the third week of Abraham, where God provided the promised son that he had, that Abraham and Sarah had asked for. It was a miracle. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. It, it should not have happened, it was a miraculous birth and God provided a son. So Abraham knows already that the Lord provides. But it had been some time later, we see in our text, and so God wants to test Abraham again, but Abraham's testing is really meant to also teach us today. So keep that in mind as we look at the scripture. I'm gonna teach through it, explain some things through the scripture, so your head will go up and down, up and down. Is that okay? Try not to get you too dizzy. Genesis 22, verse one. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Wow, that's a, a very interesting test. It's odd, strange, coming from God. Now, just so you know, on top of this message, right in the beginning, I just want you to know that God does not uh, condone human sacrificing in scripture. He actually condemns it. God was never gonna let Abraham go through with this, what was God doing? God was examining and testing Abraham's heart. And God looks at our hearts and God looked at his heart and saw that he was willing to even give up his one and only son that he had waited so long for. And so just so you know, when we go to apply this today, there's no such thing as us giving up our children for a sacrifice like that, okay? So I make sure we all understand that. But spiritually, we can give our children to the Lord. We can give our friends, our family to the Lord by surrendering them over to God and praying for them and asking God to save them and work on them, amen? So verse three, the next morning Abraham got up early. You think he was struggling to sleep? Or maybe he was eager to obey. We're not sure. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. I wanna show you real quick um, this scripture, or I'm sorry, this map, just to show you an idea of the distance he was gonna travel. So he was in Beersheba near the bottom there, and Moria was up towards the right to the left of Salt, the Salt Sea, okay? And so 50 to 60 mile trip on foot, okay, or animals. And so that's three days, three days to actually question everything and turn back. Think about that for a moment. Three days to go, ah, never mind, I'm going back home. Instead, he continued to Mount Moriah. So it's important, I want you guys to see that. Can you put yourself in his shoes a little bit? That's a long time to consider and a long journey to walk three days and go, ah, uh, you know, I don't know. Am I really supposed to be doing this? So verse four, on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there and then we will come right back. Now, first of all, Abraham demonstrates faith by getting up 
and going to the mountain and obeying God. That's the first moment he demonstrates faith in God. The second moment is right here. Do you notice what he just said? He told his servants, we will both be back, in other words. Now, my friends, if we read this too fast, we miss this. Abraham believed that he would come back with his son to his servants after the trip to the mountaintop. That is faith. That is faith early on in this little journey of his, in this story, in our scripture today. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. That's plural. Verse six, so Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. What is the fire? And it's, I thought that was kind of weird. It sounds like it's already lit. It was. They, they would have either fire pots or they would have torches. They would have lamps where the fire would be lit already and so they would carry that from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. And so the, there would already be a flame or a fire lit ready to be used for this sacrifice. So we move on and it says in verse seven, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Well, he's inquisitive, isn't he? Hey, dad, we're missing some stuff here. God, this is verse eight. Here's another demonstration of faith. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. God will provide. That's faith. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, I look at this from my human eyes. And I'm sitting, I'm just, I'm reading it this week again, and I'm like, what must be going through Isaac's head? Dad, you know, maybe he's like this. Uh, you may have picked the wrong mushrooms, Dad. You're, you're not hearing quite right. Or maybe you need to go back and hang out with God. And, you know, here, just double check that we're supposed to be doing this. Why am I up here? You said the Lord would provide. But we also can read in commentaries and writers of the Bible, like scholars who say this actually may be a demonstration of Isaac's faith. That Isaac has lived around Abraham long enough to see that God does provide. And when Abraham said the Lord will provide in verse eight, that Isaac believed his dad and believed that God would provide. So we see here that even Isaac is learning and Isaac is possibly trusting. We're not sure if we if we conclude with anything, would be inferring things in scripture we're, we're not supposed to. But you can kind of imagine from our perspective how scary this must have been. Can you imagine the next time Abraham wants to go on a trip? You think uh, Isaac hesitated a little bit? <laughs> but instead, what we see is faith. And, and I believe we see some faith in Isaac here, but we can't say for sure. All we know is he's on top of the wood. And Abraham, verse 10, picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, and you know how scary that would be as a father, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Now it's interesting, I find it interesting that, that God commends him for his fear. He doesn't use the word faith, he uses fear. Now, fear of the Lord, what does that mean? It means a holy, reverent obedience for God over anything else in the world. It's a zeal to do God's will over your own will. It's to be so obedient to God because you care more about pleasing God and honoring him that you fear the Lord. Not a, you're not scared of God, although, although his presence is so mighty and powerful and angels were so powerful that it did scare people at times. But what we see here is a love for God, a holy reverence for God 
that he was willing to do anything that God said. We could use that in our world right now, couldn't we? We could use that in our own walks, if we're honest, right? That we would put God's will over our own and trust him and do what he says to do, to obey. Now, verse 13 says, then Abraham looked up, and sure enough, he was right, and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in, a place, in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. You know, this, this ram makes sense. This is the top of a mountain, and we know that rams are near tops of mountains. They climb up them. So a ram was good. It was in place of a lamb. And so God did exactly what Abraham believed would happen. God provided a substitute. Now, are you aware that this is a foreshadowing of the future lamb of God? Thousands of years later, God would provide his one and only son that he dearly loved as a substitute, as a sacrifice for us. The Bible actually uses the, in the Greek for, uh, in Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 through 19, when it talks about Abraham's one and only son, it, it really refers to the words or the meaning one of a kind or unique son. And John 1.18 calls Jesus the unique one. And so we see here this picture of Jesus already in the Old Testament foreshadowing something that would be in the distance. But there's even more to that and, and there are a ton of uh, analogies and, and foreshadowings in this story. But I'm just gonna give you three. First is God's one and only son, Abraham's one and only son, the ram, and then you have Jesus who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, according to John the Baptist. And then what about the location? If you don't mind, could you go back to that map? Thank you for going with the flow here. I want you to see what's to the left of Moriah? Jerusalem. The Lord would provide our greatest need. Thousands of years later in the same location. Your greatest need is salvation from your sin, salvation from death, salvation from God's coming judgment and wrath, and the greatest gift you receive through that is eternal life, the forgiveness of your sin, to be a child of God. God provided, and he was showing us he's gonna provide a substitute for you. God provided Jesus Christ to take your place. And just so you know, we would never be able to pay the penalty. We would never have enough to pay for our sins. Only Jesus could do that. The Lord provides. Do we believe Jesus came to this earth, died and rose again? We do, we celebrate all the time Easter. The Lord provided our salvation. Then we know that the Lord will provide, amen? So what happens because of his faith and his obedience? Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will, 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 will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. See, faith also is obedience. And to believe that God will provide, we have to step out in faith and obey before we even see the provision. Amen? Amen. A little scary, right? Take some trust, take some faith. That brings us to Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, bringing us back to our main scripture uh, anchor or hub, so to say. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. 
Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned, now just notice this, uh, and just take note of this, that there was no resurrection <clears throat> for a frame of reference <clears throat> during this time. There was no example of someone rising from the dead at all. And so Abraham re reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Wow. That's how we know his faith. <clears throat> he reasoned that God would raise him from the dead. Why? Because he believed that God's promises would come true. That I would give you a son and through him the descendants would come the blessing for all people including us. Because that blessing was Jesus Christ who would die for our sins. That would come through their lineage. Abraham believed that. And he said, okay, well, if that's the case, then I'm, he must, God must be ready to just raise him from the dead then because he was gonna keep his promise. Wow, that is faith, my friends. <clears throat> that is faith. So let's apply this to our lives. I've already covered the part that no one's gonna take their kids and sacrifice or anything like that, physically. God condemns that. God does not um, uh, condone that behavior of any sort. God is against Murder, guys against people doing human sacrificing, guys against all that. God was never gonna let Isaac go, or um, Abraham go through that process with Isaac. W what do we see here? We see here that God is testing Abraham, and what it did is it revealed and refined Abraham's faith. <clears throat> God's gonna put you through tests. God will allow you to go through some things to show you, to help you see where you are and where you can grow. You know God already knows what you're gonna do, right? He's all knowing, he sees all things. He can see in advance what you're going to do, but you don't know what you're going to do. <clears throat> and more importantly, you do not know how God is gonna show up and provide. What God is asking Abraham to do is step out in faith and do what he's called him to do. And what we see is Abraham showed us great faith. Now, one of the tests that I see in this scripture is the test of our grip. Now follow with me, okay? The test of our grip. Life was good for Abraham. It had been years that he had his promised son. But when life is good, guess what we get? We get comfortable. We get complacent. Maybe a little forgetful where that blessing came from, where I'm headed, what I'm supposed to do, what my plans are. And it could be that God was testing to see the complacency or not of Abraham. And what we see was he was not complacent, he was strong in his faith. He was ready to obey. What about the grip of our love? What about our first love? Would Abraham's first love still be God? Would he still love God even more than his only son that he dearly loved? Well, he passed that test too, didn't he? He was willing to give up his son that he dearly loves, and he said, I love God. I love God over my own flesh and blood. Wow, that's hard. And he passed that test. When God calls us and tests our grip on things in this world, he calls us to give up things and give him things, doesn't he? And we see in Hebrews 11, in this whole context of the scripture, that the heroes of faith did not grip so tightly on this world that when God would test them, they wouldn't let go of the world and, and they, would, they would ignore God. No, instead, they let go of the world and they followed God and obeyed God because they were looking for the future kingdom that was coming. 
They remembered that we're only here for a season, but we'll be with God for eternity. That we are not, uh, we are foreigners in this world, we're strangers in this world, we're pilgrims in this world, just passing through, and that our grip should not be on the things of this world so much, it should be on God. <clears throat> God wants to bless you. But when God blesses you, he wants you to be a good steward of it as well. When God blesses you with a really good job, when God blesses you with finances, when God blesses you with friends, all those things, whatever it may be, healings, all those things, time, talents, treasures, when he blesses you with those things, it is now your responsibility to be a good steward. And what we see here is, is Abraham knew that nothing belonged to him and everything belonged to God. And he was willing to give back to God what belongs to him. But God blessed him and did not allow him to carry through with that. God is a generous God like that. But here's the thing about blessings, is God doesn't want you to grip on those so much at the expense of losing your love and relationship with him. I'm gonna say that one more time, ready? God wants to provide and bless, but not at the expense of losing your love and relationship with him. Do you know what I'm saying, right? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God does not give you things so that you will be distracted by them and controlled by them and love them more than him. He'll test your grip. He'll test your faith in him. He'll test your first love. He'll test what you're willing to give and what you're willing to give up. He wants your love, your devotion. He wants to see what you'll do with it. And God already knows. But what do we do with it? What do we know? Hey, what has God been asking you to give? What has God been asking you to give up? Let me start with the give up part. Has God been asking you to give up control? We love control, don't we? We love working all the plans out. We love making all the plans, making it all, I mean, obviously you should. God's a God of order and organization, all these things. But there's things that are out of our control, my friends. And there's a place where you have to give up control and give a surrendered heart to God instead. So the give up happens, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay aside this so I can give God this. And I think about my family and my friends and your family and your friends. And I think about how we may want to control outcomes with our kids and we shouldn't. All we can do is give our kids to the Lord and not be passive. We are supposed to nurture them and grow them in the things of God and pray for them and lead them the right way, teach them the right way. But at, at, at a point when they become adults, we can't really control everything that happens in our life. We can be a culture that influences, but we can't control, and it's gonna come down to God saving your kids. It's gonna come down to God working in their hearts and them humbling themselves to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. What about perfection? I gotta have everything perfect before I do something for God. I gotta have my life perfect before I do something for God. I gotta have everything in order. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, you will never find that. Sorry to tell you. Let me pop your bubble. And God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for available people. Yeah. Available people that would be obedient, live by faith, and be faithful to God. It's okay if you want to clap. It's all good. <laughs> Glory to God. God wants you to give up sinful habits and let go of the grip of the pleasure of this world because it's not going to give you anything that will last for eternity. It will actually hinder your eternity. God wants you to give up time and then give him time. Give up the control of your alone time. Give up the, the time that we hoard and want to have to ourselves all the time, but God has been calling you to go out and do something for him. It's time to surrender that. Just so you know, my friends, God has called you to make disciples. 
God has saved you so that your testimony can reach the lost. God has done work in your life. He has comforted you so you could comfort others. It's time. It's time to give him your time. It's time to love people and bring them into the fold, bring them into God. Here's one that we don't really like to talk about. You know where I'm going, right? Because Jehovah Jireh always makes you think of what? Money. We Americans love our money. But the love of money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. God is not going to bless us with more money if our hands are closed. Now, he may... He may allow people to keep growing and doing by their own effort all these things, but you are not blessed in God's eyes. If money is getting in between you and God, God wants us to release and give back to him what belongs to him. You know, God gives us it all, but he only asks, if you take the principle of tithing 10%, he asks for 10%, not 100%. It all belongs to him because he gave us breath to go to work. He gave us the energy to go to work. It's true. I'll share a little bit more of that in a moment. How about trust? This whole series has been about putting our faith and trust in him. I believe God is testing us to see if we'll finally trust him with these things. What about your health? What about healing today? What about breakthroughs and miracles taking place? Do you trust God to do it? It's time to trust him. It's time. Because lastly, testing reveals the faithfulness of God. Testing reveals the faithfulness of God. The test revealed to us Abraham's faith, but it wasn't really about that. It wasn't so much about Abraham. It was about God. It was about that God was gonna show himself to be faithful. You give me your faith, I will show you my faithfulness. You give a sacrifice of praise and worship, a sacrificial offering, whatever it may be, it's not just money. Whatever you give, I will show myself to be faithful to you and be Jehovah Jireh, the provider of all your needs. Praise the Lord. Whip blows me away of this story and it just, it convicts, it encourages, it inspires me, it does it all. Abraham left his home with his son without a lamb. And he believed that God was literally gonna provide a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice from the time he left to the time he got to the top of that mountain. He stepped out in faith, even had the blade up in the air, believing that God would give a substitute, that God would provide. In other words, he did it before the provision came. You know what we do? We always wait for the provision to come before we start being generous, before we start believing, before we think we can do it. We wait for that to come. He did it before it came, believing it would be provided. Now that is faith. And now you see why that's convicting, encouraging, and inspiring. <clears throat> God proves himself to be faithful when we step out in faith. We're gonna prepare our hearts to come and pray because I believe God wants to provide whatever you need today. And by the way, it doesn't always come instantaneously. It doesn't always come in the form that you think. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> One of our brothers here at the church by the name of Tom, we need to keep him in prayer. But Tom needed a pair of new lungs. He sits right over here and worships and in the worship service here and Tom needed some new lungs. Now just so you know, he was not even on a waiting list. But his name kept coming up in meetings with doctors and dinners. For some reason, his name kept coming up. Well, next thing you know, it, we've been praying, and next thing you know, it, God 
provides a set of lungs and they're a match for Tom. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I mean, doctors were even saying, we don't even know how his name got up to the top of the list. It just kept getting bumped up. We don't, that's, this is what he told his wife. They just kept getting bumped up. Well, the first set, uh, it didn't work out. They didn't, they didn't survive, and he wasn't under the knife yet. They just didn't survive before they got to him. Can you imagine how they must have felt? God, that was the miracle, wasn't it? No, it was the next pair. That was a perfect match for Tom. And on Friday, so far, it's been a successful surgery. And Tom has a pair of new lungs. Praise the Lord. Wow. But we need to keep him in prayer. He's not out of the woods yet, but things are moving slowly but surely in the right direction. My personal experience, here's what I know. And I'm just gonna paraphrase so we can have time at the altar. Romans 12, one through two. In view of God's mercy, offer your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your pure and true acceptable form of worship to me. And do not, do not, uh, no longer conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's good and pleasing, perfect will. I have learned that if I surrender my life, because that's all I really got more than anything, I have my life, God, I'm gonna show you that I love you and I'm grateful for what you've done for me. I give you my life and I give it to him every day. Not just at an altar, one time at a youth retreat. It's every day. I give my life to God by serving him, by honoring him, by fearing him and doing what he wants. And I have watched God provide in every single way in my life. Now I wanna talk about money again one more time because it is a prominent it is a prominent struggle for us to trust God with our finances. And God, God just proves himself in my life over and over again. Just so you know, this past week, I had a financial miracle in my life. But what it was is that God put it on a woman's heart to give what we needed. And she gave that to us. Did not see that coming. I prayed, the next day it was answered. Why? Right, because God is good. He's a faithful provider. Now this is gonna be hard, okay? This is between you and God. But this scripture verse I'm about to read is heavy. But I want you to also hear the good news at the end of it. Malachi 3, verse eight. Should people cheat God? This is God talking. Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And God says, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. And then he says this, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. It's the only time in scripture God says to test him is in money. Your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. That's preservation of your stuff. Preservation of your investments. God will preserve it, protect it. I, jokingly, I thought about this this past week. Pastor Jody's car would never break down. He must have been tithing. He, that thing just kept running and running and running. It was a four-door Honda Civic maroon color. That thing just kept going. It, you might say it's Honda. I was like, man, God's preserving this car, helping him out. I'm telling you, I'm not, I, that's a joke, but I'll be serious, okay? I have prayed that God would preserve my furnaces and my air conditioning units my car, I have done that. I have asked God, be faithful in this scripture as I am faithful to give and to tithe and to take care of other people's needs. Be faithful to fulfill this scripture. And I know you are, and I know you will. And let me read, let me read 2 Corinthians chapter nine. Just to encourage you with your faith today. 
and apply this to anything, but particularly right here in the giving. Verse six, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 6, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I would never manipulate people to give. It is the wrong thing to do as a pastor or as a church. You should decide so that you don't give reluctantly when to give and what to give, okay? For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over. Who wants the leftovers too? Oh, well, let's finish it. I'm glad you didn't say anything. To share with others. To share with others. It, you don't give to get rich. One, we give because it belongs to God. But when he gives to you, it's not just for your own prosperity, it's for the generosity that should be extended to all people around us. And there are people in need and God wants to use the people who are giving and generous to be blessings of people around them. God will fill your barn, so to say, your storehouse so you can keep being giving and generous to the work of the ministry at the church and to people in need all around you. Isn't that awesome? And it's not for your prosperity, although he's gonna, he's gonna fill with so much that you will prosper because he takes care of you. But always remember to not cling on to that money more than God, to be a good steward of that money. Amen. Why do I bring this up? Because this is a test in our society in America. Money is a test. And right now in our climate, our economy, it's a test, ain't it? I can't believe how much my groceries were. My goodness. But the Lord is faithful to provide. The Lord is faithful to provide healing today. Do you believe it? He's faithful to provide breakthroughs of salvation in your family and friends. Let's stand together and let's believe that God wants to provide whatever you need. I felt it so strongly during our worship set. I, I just felt like we, we, gotta, we, we gotta hear this word though because the word of God builds your faith as well. Hey, if you need to go, it's okay. No judging. No, none of that. Don't, no one give anyone side looks and sour looks as they walk out. It's not about that. Some people got things they gotta do and whatnot, but we're gonna have a moment here in the first service, by the way, I felt God was saying, have a desperation for him. And don't be afraid of what everyone thinks when you come down here for prayer. Have a desperation for your children. Cry out to him for healing. Cry out to him for salvation. Cry out to him for financial provision, whatever it may be. Cry out to him that you will trust him. But we do have to make that decision. Come on down if you need prayer. Just begin to pray right now with God. And our team's gonna come around and pray for you. I don't know who you're standing in the gap for, whether it's for you, whether it's for someone else. Maybe you need to get right with God today. Maybe what you need to give up is your stubborn ways or your plans and give God your life as a living sacrifice for him. Maybe it's salvation that you need to receive today the forgiveness of your sins and receive eternal life. God is faithful to provide that. Begin to pray in faith today. Give up the doubt right now. God, we give up the doubt right now in Jesus' name. We give up the worries right now. We give those up and give you faith. We give you our trust. Lord God, we thank you for the healing last week of Jenny Cox, realigning her back, removing the mass out of her back, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. You are a healer today, Lord God. You are healing, Lord God. Lord, nothing is too hard for you, Lord. We're gonna pray prayers that are ridiculous to mankind right now, but we believe you will provide whatever is needed, Lord. God, nothing is too hard for God. You can heal backs. You can heal legs, eyes. God, I pray you provide kidneys right now in Jesus' name. Provide lungs. 
In Jesus' name, restore sight by your power and might. In Jesus' name. Increase our faith, Lord, right now. Give us faith, Lord God. Thank you for the testing. We thank you for it today. We thank you for providing the testing so that our faith could grow. Lord, begin to heal and move as we sing this song, as we worship you. Lord, we thank you that during our worship, that God, you were healing last week. Worship this week. Lord, as we worship you, God, heal this week. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Let's sing it out to him. Let's pray out to him.